Hey, good afternoon. My name is Dustin Spittler. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Field Devotionals, a ministry of Vision Baptist Church in Riley. Hope you and your family are doing well. This week on our devotional series, we're talking about the dangers of favoritism. Last week, I'm sorry, last devotional on Tuesday, we saw this idea that prejudice, prejudging, causes favoritism, which can cause jealousy within the church, within the family, and within society in general. we got to be careful not to judge a book by its cover. We need to read a few pages before we understand what needs to be done and how we can help. And in James chapter 2, he's really dealing with this idea how we can really help people. We can't play favorites and prejudge. We must take time and find out what the works in the faith are before we can truly help. And so this time we're talking about in this lesson this idea of four questions that James proposes to help us evaluate if we are playing favorites. The first question is in verse number uh, four, and the question is this, how do Christians view the poor? Look at verse four. It says, are you not partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Now, this is the end of a sentence, and, and really the first part of what we looked at on Tuesday. The, the illustration is for context that a, a rich man walks into a church and he has a goodly ring and he has nice clothes and a poor man walks in right behind him who does not have any ring and has terrible looking clothes. Is it it is a temptation for then the people to say, oh, the rich man, why don't you come sit in this nice place? And oh, poor man, why don't you go stand over there in the corner and stay away from me? And then he says by this question, are you not being partial? And this idea of partial is to separate, to withdraw from. Are you not being partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts. And so he's asking, if a, if a rich man walks in and a poor man walks in, are you able to read their mind to see what's really going on in their hearts? Can you tell me that that rich man has it all together and he's humble before God and he deserves to be honored? And can you tell me that that poor man is resisting God and against God and needs to be shunned? Can you tell that just by looking at it? I don't know about you, but in our town, there are several places in, in our county where you can find somebody standing by on the side of the road or in, around a lane with a sign in their hands. It is not right for us to look at that person and automatically judge, oh, they're evil. But that's what some of us are tempted to do. We're tempted to look on the outside without knowing the situation and say, that person is evil or that person is sinful. What did this guy do to do something wrong? And that's not necessarily true. You're not allowed to judge until you know what's going on. You're not allowed to make up your mind until you can discern the situation. Now, once you understand who the person is, then you can understand how to feel and how to help or how, or how, how not to help, depending on them. But you just can't look at somebody without knowing them without having any conversations with them and say, oh, that person's evil. That's not right. How do you view poor people? Can you see people's thoughts? Can you look into their hearts? Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7, Samuel's trying to pick the next king, and he goes into the house of Jesse, and he looks at one guy, and says, man, he looks great. One of David's brothers, man, he looks like he should be king. And listen what God says to him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, don't look on his countenance, his face, his, his, his exterior. Don't look on the countenance nor the height of his stature. Because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man uh, looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now this is a verse we're going to look at later on in this chapter when it comes to faith without works. But you cannot judge solely uh, just on appearance only. You must see and, and view the person's faith. And their works are shown showing their faith. So he says you can't do that. So are you tempted to view a poor person or maybe a person of, you know, a different state or maybe a, a, a city person versus a rural person, uh, maybe a Republican versus a Democrat, maybe a white person versus a black person and say, oh, just based upon what I see on the exterior, I've already made up my mind on them. That's wrong. That's wrong. Second question deals with how does God view the poor? Listen to question 
Number two, in verse number five, he says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which hath promised to them that love him? What's he saying here? God views poor people differently. Do you know in the Beatitudes, Jesus spoke about several Beatitudes, and the first one dealt with poverty. Matthew 5, 3, he said, Blessed are the poor. Now, not just poor, physically, economically, but poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Do you know a person can't get saved until they become poor? Do you know a person can't change until they become poor? Do you know a person can have no spiritual growth until they say, I am poor spiritually, I am bankrupt, and I need God, I need some other source to help me. God says poverty economically, can lead to riches spiritually. He says you can be poor physically, but spiritually rich. And don't we have a good illustration of that, of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16? Here's a rich man who has everything, and there he has a poor man that lives at his gate and has nothing. The, the poor man's name is Lazarus. We do not know the rich man's name. We know about him that he fared sumptuously every day, had everything he wanted, and Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores. And when the rich man died, we found that he had zero faith. He was rich physically, but bankrupt spiritually. And the Bible says he went to hell. And here's Lazarus. When he died, he was bankrupt physically, but was rich spiritually and wound up in the arms and the bosom of Abraham, it says, in paradise. Don't always judge a book by its cover. God views poverty as something greater. It's an avenue to become spiritually rich. Third question, how do rich men view Christians? And then that leads us to our second question, or second, or fourth question, actually, in verse 8. How do rich men view God? Now listen to this. We'll put these together. Do they, rich men, Blaspheme, I'm sorry, but they have depressed the poor, verse 6, sorry, and do, uh, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme the worthy name by which ye are called? And so James says here to the, to, the, to the Christian, why are you so eager to have your back scratched by rich people? Rich people, most of the time, are the ones that are oppressing the Christian and blaspheming the Lord. Beware of trying to go after rich men just because of what they can give to you. How does God view them? Now again, stop for a second. Not every poor person is good, and not every rich person is good. Not every poor person is bad, and not every rich person is bad. Right? But sometimes rich people, not all of them, but sometimes rich people are very stubborn when it comes to God. Jesus said himself, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Because they depend on their riches and they think they do not need God. We need to be careful. Rich men, and, and we'll say it this way, proud men oppress the Christian and blaspheme God. Humble men look to God, and enter our blessing to those around him. So we've got to make sure uh, who we're going after here. We've got to make sure how we're treating people. We need to be fair. Don't play favorites, okay? Because, again, prejudice, prejudging, leads to favoritism, and favoritism leads to jealousy. And that is not what we're going for in the church and in our homes. Hope this has been a blessing to you. Hope it's been an encouragement. See you next time.